You're an anesthesiologist. Right. I take away people's consciousness and restore it every day. I've been doing it for 38 years. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and your initial foray into consciousness was through, uh, with your partnership with Sir Roger Penrose. No, actually, I got start, uh, interested in consciousness in uh, undergraduate in the late 60s. In medical school, I gravi gravitated toward neurology, neurosurgery. But I got interested in structures inside neurons called microtubules, which I decided in the early 70s were biological computers, and in fact, quantum computers, and was going around saying that, that to understand the brain and consciousness, we couldn't just see uh, 100 billion neurons interacting at synapses, but needed to go inside the neuron to the microtubules where all, all this more information processing was occurring. But that didn't solve the hard problem, and somebody suggested I read Roger Penrose's book, we had a, he had a mechanism for consciousness based on a type of quantum collapse of the wave function connected to the finest scale structure of the universe, space-time geometry, the Planck scale that, that, that Nick mentioned, for example. He had a mechanism, but not a structure. I had a structure, not a mechanism. We teamed up in the early 90s, developed a theory of consciousness uh, based on quantum computations in brain microtubules connected to the fine scale structure of the universe, Planck scale geometry. And by the way, I think that gets around a lot of the problems that Don Hoffman said. It was a great talk, but I disagree with most of what he said. So, well, we can talk about that later. Uh, I think what people, I, I don't see a contradiction, by the way, because uh, I... Well, he gives up on uh, reality, and I think there is a reality out there. Oh, but there's a reality. It's not perceptual. But let's... let's he and I have been arguing about this for years, so. That's <laughs> okay, let's talk about what we originally intended to talk about in the, in, in the time that we have, and that is very fascinating to all of us, yeah. is that's the anthropic principle. So the anthropic principle uh, describes the fact that the universe is perfectly tuned to support consciousness and life. There are about 20 or 22 uh, uh, constants, uh, dimensionless numbers, that dis define the mass of the electron, the charge uh, of the proton, the ratio of the proton to the neutron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if these weren't exactly, or almost exactly what they were, all 22 of these numbers, there wouldn't be stars giving off light, there wouldn't be life, and there wouldn't be consciousness. The question is, how did the universe get so perfectly tuned? The odds against this are gazillions of gazillions of gazillions to one. And the answer in modern science is that there are an infinite number of multiple universes, and only in this one that we're in are conditions right for consciousness, so we're here asking the question. Otherwise, you know, it'd be an, uh, an infinite impossibility almost. So that's the party line. There's an infinite uh, number of universes, and we won the cosmic lottery by being in this one uh, to ask the question about consciousness. Now, I don't agree with that. Roger Penrose and I ha have a new paper coming out, and in it, uh, we, uh, again, we have consciousness and platonic values, good, evil, aesthetic, ethical values, all imprinted or embedded in, in the Planck scale geometry, like the picture Nick showed, uh, along with platonic values, consciousness, and mass, spin, charge, all the irreducible features of the universe that gives rise to everything that, that, we, that, that exists. And, uh, we think that, uh, uh, Roger also has another theory, by the way, that the Big Bang was preceded by another eon with a Big Bang, and another one before that, and another one before that. So that rather than multiple parallel universes, he sees serial universes or serial eons in one universe. And in that view, we think, and we propose in this paper, that when the universe has a rebirth, recycles, uh, with a new Big Bang, that these dimensionless constants, these numbers, mutate and evolve, much like genes mutate and evolve. And the next universe is, uh, is an evolved version. So then the question is, what is it evolving towards? What is the fitness function uh, for the uh, universe? And we think it's consciousness, that the universe is evolving uh, either through eons or even in this eon 
And these fine numbers, uh, uh, these, these dimensionless constant numbers are evolving and mutating slightly to optimize conditions for consciousness in this universe. So in a sense, consciousness is driving the universe. The universe is evolving to optimize consciousness. The universe is evolving to optimize consciousness. Yes. And it recycles, it reincarnates, it goes through birth and death just yes. like every other thing that exists. Yes, if you believe that, which you do, and actually I do too, but not everybody does. So Planck scale space-time geometry uh, is 25 times smaller in order of magnitude than an 25 atom. orders of magnitude. Uh, 25 orders of magnitude smaller than an atom. So you go down, down, down to what you call the basement of the universe where everything disappears. And this is... Uh, well, I, w I wouldn't say everything disappears. I would say that at that level, there's information. If you imagine yourself shrinking in below the level of atoms, everything might seem smooth and featureless until you got to the Planck scale, and then you see information. Now, what it looks like, we don't know. Strings, uh, twisters, spin networks, uh, quantum gravity, quantum geometry, but it's some pattern of information, kind of like that cartoon. And that information is quantum entangled, right? It's, it's non-local so, so that it repeats. In fact, uh, Don mentioned to Hooft with his two-dimensional projection, which is the basis for the holographic principle of the universe, which means that everything repeats at scale like in a hologram. Re wherever you go, you see the same image, you just lose clarity and focus, which to me says that consciousness is related to this fundamental, le fundamental level of the universe, the Planck scale, and it actually kind of explains it. Microtubules, you say they're quantum computers. How big are they? Microtubules are 25 nanometers in diameter, and they can be in your, in your uh, sciatic nerve, for example, they might go from your spine to your foot, so they can be very long. But in, in the dendrites of the brain, they're short and interrupted. But they're, they're mesoscopic uh, objects, but uh, it's now been shown by a man named Anurban Banjapati working in Japan that they have quantum coherence, quantum resonances at specific resonant frequencies in the kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz range at warm temperature in the brain, which means Deepak, that your microtubules right now are resonating, for example, in megahertz in your brain, and that's allowing them to do quantum computing and allowing you to be conscious and connecting you to the fine scale structure of the universe. And how many of these microtubules would you say there are? Well, if you count the number of tubulins, which are the subunits, which would so sort of be a bit of information, uh, there's about a billion per neuron. And they're switching at, say, 10 mega megahertz, so that's 10 to the 16th operations per second. That's the same number that uh, neuroscientists get from neuron switching at synapses, about 10 to the 16th operations for the whole brain. So going to the microtubule level gets you a whole lot more information and explains how single-cell organisms can be clever. But that by itself doesn't really explain consciousness. For that, you need the connection to Planck scale geometry, where the qualia are, where we solve the hard problem. But what you're saying is, I mean, if you just multiply the number of computations by the number of microtubules. 10 to the 27th operations per second in the brain. 10 followed by 27 operations per? For, per second for per the whole second. brain. Per so, second. Uh, and you need the 20 or so constants to make that happen. The universe has to be properly tuned to, ha to have this access between the brain, the microtubules, and the fine scale structure of reality. That's, that's our argument and our suggestion. And it's either that or there's a million other gazillion, an infinite number of other universes out there doing nothing while we're sitting here being conscious. So I think our view is actually more parsimonious than having all these uh, uh, infinite number of universes uh, that are useless. Okay, coming from that massive, amazing vision of how the universe created us through this anthropic principle, so we could have this conversation, look back at the stars. Um, you have a new technology, actually, uh, which yeah. you might want to So mention. I'm an anesthesiologist, and uh, in the medical field, as you know, there's been uh, techniques to stimulate the brain non-invasively, transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial electrical stimulation. And in the last couple of years, people have been using ultrasound into the brain. Ultrasound is used to image uh, babies in, in, in the in uterus and various parts of the body. It's harmless. It's been around for years. And uh, the microtubules have resonances in megahertz, 10 million, uh, a million to 10 million per second, and ultrasound is the same frequency. So it occurred to me that, uh, and somebody published a paper, a guy named uh, Jamie Tyler published a paper showing that ultrasound of the brain of animals cause behavioral changes, and I wondered, maybe they're stimulating the microtubules, maybe that would be a way to 
affect consciousness. And so I talked to my colleagues about using ultrasound on chronic pain patients uh, who were depressed to see if it can improve mood. And they said, we got to try it on ourselves first. It's your idea. you got a shaved head. You're first. <laughs> and uh, so one day I said, okay. So I, I took our ultrasound machine we used in uh, anesthesia. I put some gel on it, put it up to my, my temple for 15 seconds. I didn't feel anything. Nothing happened. I put it down. I said, well, heck with that. That didn't work. And about a minute later, though, I got a buzz. And I felt really, really good for about an hour. Like my brain was, was, was ringing, was chiming. I felt a lot of positive energy. I felt very, very good for about a, a, an hour. And so we did a study with pain patients, and we found that 15 seconds at 8 megahertz caused improvement in mood 10 and 40 minutes afterwards. We did a follow-up study that sh showed even better with 2 megahertz for 30 seconds. And we're working with a company who's making a headset device. They hope to market for general mood enhancement and entertainment. And we also think it might promote uh, microtubule activity in neurons to make new neurons, make new connections. And since uh, microtubules are, are, fall apart in Alzheimer's disease, microtubules are disrupted in, in brain injury, that this may be useful for brain injury, Alzheimer's, P, uh, PTSD, and many other uh, 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 neurological and psychiatric disorders. Last question. What is the quantum soul? <laughs> so uh, that was a... <laughs> So Deepak and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago uh, for a book about uh, basically uh, uh, death and the possibility of afterlife. And I think that consciousness happens uh, in the brain, in microtubules, but in the space-time geometry that's associated with microtubules. And it's actually a process in fundamental space-time geometry. And uh, I, we know about near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. And I was asked about this, and I said, according to our theory, it's possible that when the, the blood stops flowing, the, the oxygen stops being delivered, that the quantum coherence can persist in the microtubules, and then when the microtubules fall apart, can dissipate to the universe at large, non-locally, but remain entangled as one entity uh, by entanglement, so as sort of a quantum soul. So this was a plausibility argument for the, ex the possibility of, of an afterlife. If the patient's revived, the quantum soul, if you will, goes back inside the brain, and the patient had an out-of-body near-death experience. If not, there could be reincarnation or, or, or indefinite uh, existence uh, in space-time geometry, which is non-local. So I'm not arguing that this exists. I don't have the proof or evidence for afterlife or, or any of this, but I think it's plausible. I think this is a plausibility argument, and he and I wrote this paper, a chapter, uh, arguing that this is plausible and could happen, and until science in general can, ex can explain consciousness in the brain, we can't rule, consciousness, uh, rule out consciousness out of the brain. Final, really final question. End of life gamma synchrony. Yeah. So it was noticed uh, about 10 years ago that uh, if you put uh, brain monitors like EEG on patients as they die, on subjects as they die, people who uh, have terminal illness, that they, they pull the plug, they know they're going to die, and, and uh, so they put uh, brain monitors on, and uh, these, these machines give a number from 0 to 10, uh, sorry, 0 to 100, where uh, 80 to 100 is conscious, 40 to 60 is where it's recommended we keep our patients under anesthesia to avoid awareness, and below 40 there's something wrong with, with the brain. So these people have something wrong with the brain, but it wasn't zero. And uh, so as the heart stopped and the blood, blood pressure dropped, these, the number dwindled down towards zero. And then as the heart stopped, there was a burst of activity that turned out to be gamma synchrony. That's uh, EEG from 30 to 90 hertz, actually uh, up to 130 or 170 hertz, uh, which is the best marker of consciousness known. And this occurred for uh, 90 seconds to 20 minutes in some cases in patients. Now, I do anesthesia, and occasionally we do organ procurement for patients who are brain dead, and I put these on, and I saw the same thing, and it was absolutely stunning. We literally jumped. It was so uh, uh, strange, but it was, it's a real effect. So uh, recently, George Mashur uh, from University of Michigan published a paper in rats where he uh, caused cardiac arrest and did very sophisticated EEG and saw this same very high-frequency uh, coherence in the gamma synchrony including front to back connectivity and all the things that tell you that, that are markers of consciousness, the best correlate of consciousness ever seen happened right after uh, the heart stopped. And it could be, we don't know what it is, it could be an artifact, it's not an artifact because it's coherent across the whole brain. It could be that it's, I mean, one interpretation would be that it's the soul leaving the body, that, which implies that rats would have souls, if you believe that, but it, all, all God's creatures got microtubules, so why not? And uh, so we don't know what this is, but it's uh, something that's going to be, uh, gonna be uh, studied more, and we're going to hear more about it. But we can say that death may be the most awake moment. 
at the time. It, we could say that. Thank you.